Bienvenidos a este programa especial de Canal 22 con Robert McKee, uno de los grandes maestros contemporáneos del guionismo para hablar sobre los relatos, sobre las historias que nos mueven y nos conmueven. ¿Por qué somos buscadores de historias? ¿Por qué las buscamos en el cine, en la televisión, en las novelas? Vamos a hablar con este gran experto, pero antes tendremos una semblanza de Robert McKee. Robert McKee nació en Detroit, Michigan en 1941. Es considerado uno de los grandes maestros de la enseñanza del guionismo. Desde 1984, más de 50.000 estudiantes han asistido a sus seminarios en ciudades como Los Ángeles, Nueva York, Londres, París, Sydney, Toronto, Múnich, Oslo y Barcelona. Es autor del libro El Guión, Sustancia, Estructura, Estilo y Principios de la Escritura de Guiones. Ha marcado varias generaciones en la creación de historias para el cine y la televisión. En vez de concentrarse en los aspectos mecánicos de las técnicas narrativas, McKee enfatiza la necesidad de escribir historias emocionalmente significativas. Un importante número de guionistas que siguen los principios de McKee han sido distinguidos con diversos reconocimientos internacionales. Robert McKee, thank you very much for this interview with no, Channel 22. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I would like to talk about the hunger for stories. Why is there such hunger for stories? Why do we consume so many stories? We uh, read and see films as much as we dream. What is this all about? Well, uh, there's been a lot of research uh, over the last 30, even 40 years trying to understand how the human mind works, trying to understand consciousness, trying to understand memory, trying to understand imagination, how, how does the mind work? And the best understanding now is that the mind is a machine for telling stories. That the way the human mind absorbs all the stimuli from life 24 hours a day and then ex eliminates all the banality, all the triviality, It concentrates on moments of conflict, on turning points of value, cause and effect, and shapes its experience into a story for itself. And by converting actuality into story is the way the mind understands itself and its place in the world. And, um, and so it, it's no accident, of course, that human beings tell stories to one another Uh, because, uh, as a great critic, uh, Kenneth Burke, once said, yes. He, yes, he said, stories are equipment for living. And without great storytellers to, to lift our understanding of our own life and our place in the world and what it is to be a human being, life would be unbearable. Yes, exactly. And this means that story uh, fits something into our search of meaning. And in this way, You have search writers like Joseph Campbell and uh, Paddy Chayefsky mm -hmm. and Arthur Kessler to look, look into creativity and the search of meaning for meaning. That's very interesting. Yes, well, the, the, the concentration since the Enlightenment and since the Greeks really has been on the rational side of the brain, how the brain analyzes data, draws deductive or inductive uh, conclusions and follows chains of uh, causality, the whole rational mind. The, that apparently is only half our brain, it's the left half. What the right half uh, instead has an analogical logic. And what the right brain can do is take two things that have no relationship, two memories, two Uh, experiences, two uh, dreams you have, or two of anything, and discover the third thing that connects those two. And so creativity is the discovery of the hidden connection between two things that already exist, but a connection that no one else would have seen before. And when you take two things from out of yourself, fuse them into a third thing, you put something new into the world that never existed, before that moment that you created it. And this right brain power <coughs> then feeds these, these uh, bits of creativity to the left brain where it gets processed. But, but the, the ability of the right brain to find these uh, hidden connections 
is the, is the great genius, of course, of the human mind. Uh, the left brain uh, does what computers do. The right brain does what only a human being can do. And in this way, you search the work of uh, Arthur Kessler. Why it was so interesting for you? Uh, I, I don't remember how I found this book. It's, it's the title, of course, is intriguing, called The Act of Creation. And uh, wow, I, I pulled it off a shelf in a bookstore or a library somewhere. And, and it's a book about, of course, the essence of creativity. The first third of the book is about comedy. Because he says, in the making of a joke, in the creation of a joke, you see the creative power of the mind most clearly. Because jokes always work around some kind of duality, taking two things and turning them upside down, inverting them, whatever. And so in the, in the design of the joke, you see creativity at, at its most clear. And then the second third of the book is about story and about creativity and story. And the last third of the book is about science and how science, of course, is a great creative form as well. And how all three, all three do exactly the same deep thing. They take two seemingly unrelated things, find a hidden connection, and create, and fuse uh, something together that, uh, that never existed before that moment. In that way, science is a narrative of the world also. But when we have movies, we have metaphors for life. We have, in just two hours, to, to capture this whole thing. That's, it's amazing. How can we do that? And it seems a little bit artificial, but at the same time, it feels right. It well, feels that when there is artistry there, something connects. Art is artificial, by definition. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, <coughs> uh, manipulative, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, uh, and w it, of course, the, the, the audience or the reader or someone going to a museum, we go to the artist uh, with our hands open, our, our, our hearts open, and we say, manipulate me. Move me. Move me. I give myself to you. Right? Let me look at your painting. And my eye moves on the canvas and you see into it. And you hear the music of, of a great <coughs> composer. And, uh, 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 and so you are, of course, willingly manipulated. And the word manipulation, of course, has a, has a negative connotation to it because people say, well, you know, films are so manipulative. Uh, Hollywood especially is so manipulative. Steven Spielberg is particularly <laughs> manipulative. And uh, in that sense, it's true, because they, they, um, they recycle cliches. And uh, the problem with cliches is that they work. That's why people use them over and over. Somebody came up with an original idea, and ever since then, that, that, uh, that, that particular idea is effective, and so it gets reused and reused. And, um, and so, um, and so the, uh, we, we want to manipulate in order to uh, express ourselves uh, to our audience, to our readers, um, but not the same old way. And so the problem for the artist is this constant challenge. There's, there's a, there was a great movement of, uh, of critics uh, back in the 1920s called the Russian Formalists. And the Russian Formalists said the essence of art is to make a stone stony. To take this thing that you know so well, a stone, and suddenly make you feel it all over again and realize how stony a stone is. And all artists do this because the material is life, which we know, okay? And we have experienced life from artists for all of our lives. And so you have to take life, which we know so well, and yet make it all new so that we feel it afresh in a whole new and um, and uh, effective way, uh, and that obviously takes some um, talent and great genius, uh, especially today. Enseguida volvemos con Robert McKee, uno de los grandes maestros del guionismo contemporáneo, para hablar sobre los buscadores de las historias, por qué nos mueven y nos conmueven los relatos.
Estamos de regreso en este programa especial con Robert McKee, uno de los grandes maestros contemporáneos del guionismo, para hablar de los buscadores de historias, para seguir conversando sobre la importancia que tienen los relatos en nuestras vidas. And you have been studying all these structures, the structures that works in Aristotle till now, the structures of narration, of stories, since Aristotle till Hollywood. And in this way, you discover some, some things that work, but what nowadays is needed to refresh narration? Uh, there's two great themes, I would think, that are going to be the most important in the future. Power and alienation. On one hand, we're going to have tremendous power struggles in the, in the future between corporations, between corporations and governments, between governments. The whole social upper layer of life is going to be in constant turmoil. And, <coughs> um, and I have no idea which way that power struggle will go. But this is new. <coughs> this, this, that, that corporations have now lifted themselves up to a position of power where they can challenge government. Um, the second is alienation. While all that's going on, people are less and less connected to each other. Th th there's an addiction in the world, a whole brand new addiction has been born. Um, people on their iP iPads, mm -hmm. on their iPhones, right? Texting and uh, Facebooking and the community, you know, c what they call connection. <coughs> their connections, in fact, are alienation. There's a, there's a, there's a psychologist, a whole movement of psychology in America now, to cure children of their texting addic addiction. Hmm? <coughs> and the first step is to make them make a phone call. They cannot talk to people, they text. And there are children, middle class, upper middle class children in America who are nine, 10, 11 years old and have never talked to anyone over a telephone. They can barely speak to their parents and their fellow students face to face in school because they have become so withdrawn into this little world. And as technology makes this more and more possible and, and the pressures of life become greater and greater, uh, people uh, are going to experience the existential crisis in, in the 21st centuries in ways they never experienced it in the 20th. So you're saying that this is going to be reflected in the new narrative. I'm saying that, that, that the, the, the form of story is universal and eternal, but it is an instrument to look at life and the new stories will come from the artists who will see these great struggles within human beings. These great conflicts. These great internal conflicts and great social conflicts and everything in between. And they will, they will use the form of story is improvisationally and, uh, and imaginatively, but somehow keeping the essence of the form so that the audience can be hooked, engaged in interest, held and progressed for two or more hours, and then satisfied with a meaningful emotional experience. Meaningful emotional experience. Yes. This is the spine, maybe, of your life and your work. These words, meaningful emotion experience something that you remark again and again, and let's us see something that can be made in more than in a portrait of your life and your work into a story of your life and your work. I would like to see some, uh, some of the inciting incidents set in motion your, your story, your personal story. You it's were, it's you were an actor, story. you <laughs> were an actor. Uh, yes, I was. But um, uh, when I went to the university, I had a scholarship. And in order to win this scholarship, I had to tell the scholarship people, of course, that I was a very serious person. And, um, and that I wanted to be a dentist. I not only wanted to be a dentist, I lied to them. I wanted to be a pediatric dentist. <laughs> I wanted to fix children's teeth. And this, this brought tears to the eyes of the scholarship committee, so I won a scholarship. And uh, in 20 minutes at the university, I realized I did not want to be a dentist. And 
my scholarship people said, well, you have to have um, uh, a well-rounded life here at the university. You have to do some extracurricular things as well. And so I said, how about if I do a play? And they said, fine. So I, I got an audition for a, a, a musical, and I was cast with the only non-singing, non-dancing, non-comic part in a, in a musical comedy. And I'm sure I was very bad. But when I stepped out on stage, I thought, who are you kidding? This is the life that you want. And I could, I'll bet you I could go to the stage of the Lydia Mendelssohn Theater in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and find the board that I was standing on when that flash went through me that this was my life. Because I had been an actor as a child and whatever, but I, I just could never be serious about it. But suddenly I knew I had to be in this world. And so I became an actor, then I became a director in New York, and I spent mm, the first uh, almost half of my life in the theater. And then uh, I moved out to, um, to uh, Los Angeles to try to go from stage to screen, and I became a, a very busy uh, television and uh, film writer. And then it came a turning point when you wrote a book called Story, and you began to to give your seminars. Now what happened was, um, I was I was writing a lot of television episodes, cop shows usually. Um, I wrote a, a number of uh, films uh, that um, that they would option, they'd pay pay me for, but they wouldn't make. But then I got a film, a TV film, uh, made. Uh, I did. I wrote the pilot for um, uh, the Turner miniseries on the Bible. I wrote Abraham with uh, Richard Harris, Barbara Hershey. Uh, Maximilian Schell, uh, Joseph Sargent directing, wonderful director. And I saw my work in full length, motion, four hours. And I looked at it and I thought, it's good. I can write, this is, you know, this is good, but I am not Ingmar Bergman. And I never will be. And so I could spend the rest of my life doing good professional work or and at the same time, I had been giving uh, lectures on writing at uh, University of Southern California Film School and um, at a private film school in LA as well. And I discovered in giving these lectures and working face to face with writers that, that at this, I was really good. <laughs> okay. At, at that understanding the structure of understanding the story. I, you know, I, was, I, I had enough talent that I could write professionally and have a career. But understanding story and making it clear to others was a talent that was much more I I I developed in me than, than writing talent. And so I, I decided that Abraham was the last professional thing I wrote. And I decided to, um, to really study the art of storytelling, as you said, from Aristotle to Derrida, and everybody in between on all sides of the Atlantic and Asia as well. And I spent three years, 300 titles or more on my bibliography, and I discovered that over these centuries, the, the vocabulary changes, the terminology changes, but everybody's looking at the same thing. They're all looking at story whether it's Homer or Euripides or, or Shakespeare, they're all looking at the same essential thing. And they're all trying. It's like, you know that joke about blind men putting their hands on the elephant? Yes, yes, that's really funny. They're all putting their hands on the elephant of story, and they're seeing it their own way in different ways. And so I, I read through all of this, and I, I came to understand it in this, in this form at the same level uh, that if somebody were to talk about the form of music, the form of painting, these underlying principles of form. Of composition, right. Of composition, <coughs> whether it's musical or graphic or narrative, there are these under underlying elements that all come to the surface somehow in utterly unique ways, <coughs> no matter who the writer is. Uh, but the form remains the same in essence. Um, and as I made this form clearer and clearer uh, to writers, it empowered them to, um, to read what they've written and understand it 
in a <coughs> whole new, fresh way. And, um, and so uh, I developed these lectures. And then um, after I thought I'd heard every single question that I could be asked, I wrote the book. And I, d I discovered that um, my, my writing about writing is, that's my real talent. <laughs> <laughs> Después de un corte, volvemos con Robert McKee, uno de los grandes maestros contemporáneos del guionismo, para seguir hablando de los buscadores de historias, de por qué las historias, los relatos, afectan tan profundamente nuestras vidas. Estamos de regreso con Robert McKee en este programa especial de Canal 22 para hablar sobre guionismo, para hablar sobre las historias que nos mueven y nos conmueven. And you know, something very interesting is that this gives you insight into life. It gives you a mirror to see yourself, to read yourself, to read the environment, to read what is around us. Yes. And in this way, there is a very good writer, there was a very good writer in Mexico uh, that... Uh, He, he was so used to plot stories, to plot drama, that when he saw his students, he just looked at them and he saw the plots. He saw where the stories were heading to. Yeah. You are a lover of stories. Doesn't this happen also with you when you see one friend or one student taking into a direction that you see, oh, this is going to be a melodrama, Oh, this is heading not to a good story. <laughs> well, the um, the one thing, one thing certainly that um, s stories teach you over the years for all of us, um, but also when you pay attention to it and study it, the one thing that you um, that you learn to read is subtext. You learn how to quiet your mind so that it's not busily worrying about the impression you're making or what you want, to quiet your mind and to look at another human being, listen to them, ask a question or two, see through their eyes and their face, and have a sense of what is living inside of this other person. Um, and to understand people at, at a level, perhaps they themselves, at least at that moment, don't understand themselves. Um, And once you can get a grasp of, of what you feel is going on inside of somebody, then it doesn't take a lot of imagination to begin to project this forward and backward. It what happened to you? What kind of childhood they must have had, what kind <laughs> of future they might have. And you become like a fortune teller in that sense, only because you can see a, 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 a slice of the now. And when you... Pay attention to your fellow human being and really care about your fellow human being, get interested in them. You can see a slice of the now. And you can see where everything is leaning in their life, where it, it, perhaps it came from, where it might go. Now, the, the more you, you know this person as a friend, of course, you discover that a lot of your first impressions were wrong mm -hmm. and that a lot of what you're reading is their defensiveness. and, and But... But this, I, don't, I don't think this is unique. This is what writers do. I mean, <coughs> I have had wonderful friendships with fine writers over the years, and I know when they sit down, their notebook <laughs> 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 right, yes. is working, all right? And they're reading me, right, as material for their art. The Frankenstein that we build with many this is pieces of human experience. Being an artist seems to me to, to live with a kind of mild schizophrenia. <laughs> the, the artist is someone who sees life simultaneously two ways. They see it as life and uh, they're re you know, living and reacting and talking, whatever, and they're, they're, they're in life. And at the same time, some part of their brain is recording it as material. For a good story. For a good story. And normal human beings don't do this. Normal human beings just live, <laughs> okay? 
artists live on two levels simultaneously, life and material for their art. And this, this ability uh, to do this probably happened to them in their childhood, uh, some kind of trauma, and I think just being a child is usually enough, but some kind of trauma gave them this split, the artist's mind that sees life simultaneously two ways. That, by the way, does not mean they have talent. The, the ability to see life as life and material, uh, a lot of people have that because they were traumatized into it, okay? But that doesn't mean they can create. Talent is a genetic thing. I mean, you're born with this. It's, this is not experience. Experience makes you want to create. Talent is, is the gene that makes your right brain um, find these hidden connections fantastically. And so you have to have both. You have to have the, the genetic talent to create and then the artist's mind to want to create. And this for the purpose of connecting. At the end is the beautiful experience of connection. I am writing a new book uh, entitled The Love Story. And it's as big as this one here. <laughs> it's 100,000 words on the art of the love story. Romantic drama, romantic comedy, tragedy, and farce for stage, page, and screen. And so it's a big study of love. And at the very heart of it, you come to realize is that human beings live best in between. Not alone, not alienated, and all within yourself, nor giving your life totally over to another human being in, s in some sort of master-slave relationship or whatever. But when two human beings live in between, in this place in between, life is lived at its best. And we call that love. So we, 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 have, we had a glimpse of your story in this, in this conversation. And I would like to ask you this. If we make the exercise of seeing your story and of seeing the arc of the character, what would be this arc in the case of a character called Robert McKee? Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just want to die with a smile on my face. I just want to be able to leave this life looking back saying, you know, I took what I had, what life gave me, and I did uh, my very best with it. And um, um, I left the world, as we say, a better place than I found it. Uh, and, that, and, um, and I loved. And, um, and I was loved. And um, I tell you, if I, were, if, uh, if I were to walk out of here right now and get hit by a taxi and killed, uh, I would go out with a smile. Because um, I've, I've, I've got all of that, and uh, all I want is more. <laughs> <laughs> more books, more lectures, and, uh, and watching uh, the people that I have uh, taught uh, achieve. Of uh, the recent Oscars, uh, five of them, five of the Best Picture nominations were my people. Five out of ten. And I can't tell you how moving that is a life dedicated to stories that move and make the other move also. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Robert McKee, thank you, thank you very much My for this pleasure. interview.